Okay, I think we can start. Uh, first of all, welcome. My name is Anthony, and on behalf of Edworks, I would like to uh, welcome you to Ethereum Meetup Poland. Uh, today is a somewhat special meeting. Um, today we will t like have an opportunity to look at three to four projects, uh, all connected somehow with uh, Warsaw and somehow connected with e EMAP. Um, my usual question is, who is here for the first time? Okay, that's a lot. Who is actually based in Warsaw? So they know. Okay, so a huge crowd outside, but also a lot of locals. Uh, so I think not to uh, like make, it, make the introduction too long, I will just pass it to Julian, uh, who will introduce IMAP. Some noise. Um, hello, everyone. I, I'm happy to, to see so many people here today, um, especially because uh, uh, I'm wearing two hats uh, today. So I'm as I'm up, but also as Dolem. Somehow we don't have I'm up t-shirt yet, so so you have to take my word on that that I'm both I'm up and, and Dolem, um, and and I, I want just to give uh, a very brief introduction, like why we have those uh, three projects here, like uh, oh, they disappeared or somewhere around. So we have Golem, uh, Omisego, and um, and Hort today uh, because they are projects, and I'm up is not really a project. It is, is a company. Uh, and I will start with a very brief uh, history of, of, or prehistory of, of IMAP, so, so how, how, how we get involved uh, into Ethereum space as uh, one of the very first uh, Polish uh, companies, um, and how that resulted in, in creating um, uh, some kind of critical mass, I hope. Here in, in, in Warsaw, we are in our office, in, in creating uh, decentralized technologies. So, so we founded IMAP in, in 2013. And now thinking back about that time, I think we were like absolutely clueless about what we want to do and what this is all about. All we knew was that we um, have our existing uh, consulting business and we also want to be build with uh, our co-founders who were software developers. Um, a software development leg around that. And we started doing some more or less random projects from software development, some exciting, some not exciting at all. Uh, but very, very early in, in that endeavor, we, we came across uh, Ethereum. We were not like in, um, in crypto space at all before that. But we, we learned about Ethereum. We, we, we got really fascinated about that. That inspired us to, to thinking about, about Golem. So, so Golem is, is in fact a, mm, a, a child born in, in, in IMAP and, and uh, quite successful spin-off of, of IMAP. Uh, then at some point in, in the late 2014, we, we became a contractor to, to Ethereum. So we, I, I, I by no means mean that we are creators of Ethereum, but we just had some developers sitting in our office and, and working on, on, on Ethereum stuff like a, a year before uh, Ethereum launched for the, for the, for the first time. Uh, and of course, that gave us some, some insights into, into Ethereum space, into the centralized space quite early, uh, as for Poland at least, which at that time was obviously like a crypto was not really very popular. Uh, in the world uh, on average and in Poland it back then and I think still also today it is uh, mostly like Bitcoin what people talk about and, and, and think about and trading while uh, obviously Ethereum promise is uh, far beyond um, usual like financial or, or monetary approach to, uh, to, to the decentralized systems. Um, so we, we worked on, on, on Ethereum, but mostly on other stuff. Uh, we continued doing like a cool project and non-cool project to, to buy our uh, food. Mm, 
And then, and then in November 2015, after uh, participation in, in DEF CON 1, we, uh, that was like a, one of the important conferences in theorem space where a lot of people ca come, like not maybe a lot on today's standards, but as for e theorem space back then, it was quite impressive uh, conference. And, and we realized, as many other people, that e theorem is, is really going to be the thing it's going to deliver. And we decided to, to get involved a little bit more. We, we, we started serious work on Golem. By, by serious, I, I mean that, that we were able to, 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 to have more developers working on, on, on that project. Also, around that time, we, we met uh, back then Omise only. It was only Omise then, uh, only later Omise go, and we started working on the, on the very, very early ideas we, we, with Omise, also as a contractor. Uh, we even did one, of, um, uh, one proof of concept using Factum. So, so, so we played a little bit with, with different technologies. Uh, before, like uh, Omise eventually converged into Omise Go, uh, and of course we we always worked as as a, as a contractor here. So like with the um, with Ethereum, I, I don't feel like we we, we are like co-creators of of, 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 of of Omise Go, but I think that people in in our team in our, in our IMAP uh, working on um, on Omise Go are co-creators of, of of Omise. Uh, and then, like uh, a lot of other interesting stuff happened in the uh, Ethereum space, DAO got hacked in, in June 2016. Uh, like a first half or the first three quarters of 2016, for people observing that scene, uh, showed quite clearly that that the crowdfunding or, or ICOs are like a, a new model of, of financing things that can become quite exciting and and. And, and because of that, like we also figure out that, that Golem makes a, a perfect fit to, uh, to, to be crowdfunded or uh, token-funded uh, project, and we did that in, in November 2016, uh, which was uh, in, in, in one, uh, on, the, on the one hand, that was the end of Golem in, in IMAP per se, because then we created Golem and, and we took over. But on the other hand, of course, like a significant part of the team and the core dev team is, is still here in Warsaw, and this is still, still partly our uh, Polish product. So, so what we do in, in a nutshell from, from the interesting things that, that are uh, to be presented here uh, at IMAP, um, first, we core dev team is, is, is based here in Warsaw in, in IMAP office, and we have a kind of personal union between uh, uh, Golem uh, and IMAP in, in my person, uh, but also other uh, people involved in, in IMAP as well. Uh, we are long-term, hopefully long-term, contractor to Omise Go, uh, and, and a significant part of, of the team working on, on Plasma is, is based here in, in Warsaw. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to all the digression to explain you what Plasma is, but like Google it, it is, it is worth it. It is one of the promising concepts in the Ethereum space. And, and quite recently, we, we also have uh, heard uh, uh, as a project uh, here, here in, in Warsaw, where like a core dev team is, is, is in Warsaw. Like, not very big yet, but this is, this is growing, and, and, and obviously the, the project has just started. And also IMAP is, is a majority shareholder here. Uh, those numbers here of people are only about people like uh, physically sitting in a Warsaw office, so, so, so the teams are much larger in, in, in many regards, especially for, 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 for Omise Go, where, where obviously this is only part of the one teams. So, um, so how, how we do that? I, I, I believe that, that we, we become, as I'm up, an execution vehicle for projects from the centralized space here. So, so for those three projects specifically, um, and this is like not, not coincidence, obviously, that those are these three projects. We think those three projects are exciting. I will tell more about that a little bit later. Um, I, I believe that we have created an, an environment to, to, to build great teams. I hope great teams. I believe they are great teams. Um, and then we accumulate competences for, for that space, which are, I, I believe, still quite unique for, for, for the world uh, and also for Poland. Um, I think that on average we are quite important hub of Ethereum and, and decentralized technologies. 
Um, and of course, we are open to, to cooperate with other great teams and, and great projects in, in, in the future. But um, here for us is, is important like, why we do that. Um, of course, this is all in a way business driven. So, so we, we, we have to always have a business like in what we do and see uh, like a long term sustainability. But I think that the most important part is that, that uh, we believe that the centralized technologies bring a uh, promise of a better, uh, fairer, and, and more free world. And, and especially in, in, in our times when we see a lot of dangers from many different directions um, to, to those values, I, I, I think that, that building this, this technologies is, uh, that technology is really, um, really important. Um, of course, uh, to do that, I, I, I believe we need to com accumulate competences and, and knowledge, knowledge to, to be part of that mov movement. Also because of the, some uh, formal and informal obstacles that we face uh, in many parts of the world, including Poland. And also like why we do what we do and we do that in the way we do is because we, we believe that those decentralized technologies are so much more than, than, than trading and ICOs and, and, and token value increase and decrease. I think that at, at the end of the day, once we are past that uh, crazy trading phase, this will be uh, quite uh, irrelevant. And what will be really important is the, the, the properties and, and values of, 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 of how systems can work in a, in a, in a different manner. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, so just to, to, to conclude, because I, I wanted to also give some, some kind of uh, lighter message. I, I believe that we are probably the best place to work in Poland if you want to get involved in, in the centralized technologies. There are others. We are not the, the only bright spot, but we are probably one of the, um, uh, of the best. Uh, so we have like exci exciting projects that are on, on technology frontier. We have like a strong startup vibe, strong startup culture, and we have a very cool brand new office where we moved only um, a month ago. So I will stop here, and uh, now you will see the really interesting parts of the presentations of the, of the three projects I have mentioned. And if you are here today in Warsaw because of I. It's just a matter of time. This is a processor. It executes small tasks at breakneck speeds. There's one in your computer, your phone, and your smartwatch. You don't need to know how it works. You only care that it's fast. Gollum is fast. And here is you, needing to simulate a neural network. But your little computer just isn't up to the task. But if you connected to Gollum, you could simulate neural networks, sequence DNA, render complex imagery, or whatever you need to do, in a fraction of the time. Let me show you how it works. Gollum is a distributed supercomputer. It taps into a global network of unused computing power, and it's decentralized. This means that no one owns it, and anyone can use it, even you. When someone has a job for Gollum, it automatically finds the best computers available for the job and pays them for the power they provide. One of them could be your computer. That could be your money. Whether it's training artificial intelligence or rendering physical models, Gollum scales with the task. And it's all made possible thanks to the Ethereum blockchain. What's more, developers can tap into this network by building apps on its platform, creating infinite possibilities. So get ready. Gollum is the future of computing. It's just a matter of time. I'm co-founder of Golem, and I'm here to tell you about the current status of the project, what are we working on, and what you can expect from us in the next few weeks. And this presentation um, will like touch many different topics. I will not go too deep into any of them, but I would like to show you this great scope of uh, different topics that we are working on.
Okay, so what is Golem? You've seen in this presentation back then, probably most of you know, it's, it's decentralized market for computing power. So if you're a um, normal person with a powerful computer that is turned on all the time anyway, you can trade with our network and get some tokens for that. Uh, or if you're a scientist or a small company having heavy computational tasks, then you can rent computer power from our network instead of paying for these big cloud providers. And we're on mainnet since April. Mm, it goes pretty well actually, like there is between few to dozen hundreds nodes in the network sharing computer power every day. There is first uh, use case implemented that explained the rendering. And no major caches, no hacks, so we're quite happy with these results. And this presentation will be about stuff that happened after the main and main and launch. Um, okay, so there is like, this version is called the Golem Brass Beta. Brass because it, there is only one use case. But beta because there is one still important component missing that is called consent and this like this additional service for additional verification that is optional and is used only in case of conflict. So if provider and request or have disagreement about uh, computational result, uh, then they can uh, ask consent to resolve this conflict for them. And uh, this service is partially implemented. Like all the use cases are implemented. First three are working on testnet, so it was like invisible for the users. There is this signing service implemented that is used to integrate with Ethereum contact and work with deposits. So right now we're testing it, improving, charging, and preparing for the audit. So we, we hope that this beta sign will be finally removed after consent service is finished. Apart from that, we're trying to improve this brass application that is working uh, on the on the mainnet. So we're trying. Okay, so we, oh, right, now it's working, great. <laughs> I always hate this stuff, sorry. Uh, okay, so Brass, we're trying to improve uh, user experience for our service, because if you, some of you are creating blockchain applications, so you know that generally user experience for blockchain application is terrible by design. You have to somehow tell user how to use all these strange tokens and inform them that they cannot like get back their password if they forget it. Difficult stuff, so we're trying to get feedback from the user and make this application as much user friendly as it's possible at the current stage. Uh, so I show you some small Weak changes that are implemented. We also try to make this network more scalable because, as I mentioned before, right now we have a few hundred nodes in the network, but if we add new use cases, we can expect the network to grow significantly. And we have to be sure that uh, we can like support all these new nodes in the network. So we implemented some new improvements. Uh, additional functionality, like ability to re for requesters to choose only more powerful machines than the one that he has. So like requester may want to have his images rendered only on machines that like that are two times more powerful than his own machine, for example. And the most exciting news of all, so GPU support. It's implemented still the last stages of tests. So in the next few weeks, you can expect uh, in column finally supporting GPU, NVIDIA GPU, there is a pull request in our repository, so if you are very impatient, you can test it right now. Okay, and now the changes in the in interface. So we're trying to hear the feedback from our users and know what they're complaining about. For example, most of our users are providers who are mostly interested in one thing, so the account stage and the amount of GNT and Ether that you want. So in the next, in the last Golem version, we took this account uh, information and number of GNT tokens and Ethereum and put it 
just in the top. I know it's just small details, but it helps generalize, improve user experience. Or for example, requests were complaining that the information about the task is hidden, so we put it more in the front in this task list. Small changes, but also we're hearing bigger complaints. There are two tokens visible, so GNT tokens and Ethereum. You have to pay for every operation in Golem in GNT, but you also need some Ether to pay for the gas prices. That's why, for example, our team in Berlin is doing like this UX workshop right now with Ethereum developers working on EIP 800-559, I think, am I right? I guess so about the ability to pay for transactions with token and not to even with Ethers. And that is like significant UX changes that can uh, significantly improve user experience, not only for the Golem application, but for all the other blockchain applications that are using Ethereum for their transactions. And here's the sneak peek from the next Golem release that is not ready yet, but should be soon, so you can see new restart options, some new stats, uh, ability to blacklist users that are misbehaving straight from the graphical user interface, and some other improvements. Okay. So let's go now to slightly more serious topics, because we're not just playing with Windows, we're also doing some more important science. So, usually when people hear about Golem, they ask two questions. And the first question that they ask is, how are you going to verify the computation? And that's a very good question with no simple answer because there's no silver bullet, no easy method that, result, that can work in every case. Like some cases can be proof of work where you can compute the task long time, but then you can verify it very quickly. But yeah, most real life application doesn't work like that. So what can you do? You have to repeat computation and compare the results. That's like this true bit approach, but it's more complicated than that. Because most real life data are not deterministic. It means that the true bit approach where you compare the data bit by bit and then find the first bit when they're different will not work for the typical use cases. And yeah, like the first use case is Blender rendering. So when you render image, artist expects what the result should look like and he gets something. But if you compare the proper results that was just generated on two different machines, it will have like very small but significant differences, like slightly different color on single pixels or the small differences on the edges, especially if it's glass or hairs or other difficult surface. So you cannot see the difference with your bare eye, but if you try to compare it exactly, you will fail. That's why we need some more difficult and more advanced metrics to compare images. And like assume that if the user doesn't see, like the normal human being is not seeing the difference, then it's the same, but it may have different values. So our CGI team was asked to prepare a better verificator, a metric for comparing images. So what they're exactly doing is they rendering small part of the image and then apply this metric to make sure that the results are correct. And they were experimenting with many, many different metrics. Some of them are mentioned here. But that was like a guessing game. So what kind of threshold should you set on the structural similarity metrics to be sure that the human being assumed that this image looked exactly the same? Hard to tell. That's why they decided to stop guessing and use machine learning and they train uh, the generation of decision tree, and the final decision tree, generation, I don't remember the number, seven probably, was implemented recently in Golem. It has like nine level of depth, 247 nodes, and it classifies images pretty well. 
If you're more interested in this topic, there was blog post recently by our CGI team, and it's really interesting. Let's explain in more details why there is this undeterminism in the computation and how we can fight with it. As I mentioned before, I will just jump from one topic to another. And now, again, something completely different. So we were talking about verification for Blender images previously, but the Golem is not only a render farm, especially not a Blender render farm. We also want to support other use cases, especially in the future we want to support arbitrary computation and allow every developer to add their own use case to Golem. So we're trying to create this task API that will allow to easily integrate with Golem, but to make sure that our API is generalized enough and uh, good enough, we're trying to implement some use cases right now on our own. We're making some experiments with machine learning, with neuroscience, with computational chemistry, cryptocurrency mining, and we're still searching for other use cases. So that's the call to action to all of you. Like some of you may be developers or business persons that have a good use cases that can use these few hundreds nodes that are currently in Golem network and potentially even more that can be added if your use case is cool enough. And if you can think about something that can be run in this parallel manner and the size of the data that you're using is not too big, like below one gigabytes or preferably be below 300 megabytes, then please contact us. Like this nice to have or nice to have, we can deal with use cases that are not fulfilling this nice to have requirements. And mm, we can give you some support with implementing this column integration, uh, some financial support also, and some technical support. So if you have a cool idea, we can then help you promote your use case and use this huge amount of computing power that is scattered around the cloud. Next topic, as I warn you. But this one is the most interesting in the whole presentation but also quite difficult. So, our work with SGX. Uh, for years, people were trying to solve the problem of protecting the host from the code that is run on it. That's why we have different virtualization. That's why we have different sandboxing. And when people come to us and ask us the first important question about the verification, then they ask us a second question about how are you going to protect the data and how are you going to assure the data confidentiality? I don't want to send the data to the network and then someone can watch it. People are doing that with cloud providers. They can check, the, they can see their data but somehow people more trust big companies than some random guys that are scattered around the globe. And that's a philosophical and psychological question. Why it's that, but it's not important. Um, so what can be done? Like there is some zero knowledge computation, but it's not efficient enough to be used for like bigger computations. And the answer can be like hardware solution, especially Intel is like the pioneer here, implementing their software guard extensions. It's the part of the hardware that is protected from the host. And what's even better that it can assure that the right code was executed in the end life. So the right code was executed, verification is done, and the host was not able to pick inside because it's signed with this hardware key. That's why, so we have this data protection as well. Sounds really cool, right? So why it's not most broadly used? Because it was created to write only small piece of code like verifying the keys. And it's quite difficult to write code that can be executed in the end life. 
you have to write C++ code uh, that is specially compiled for the enclave, and you have to replace all the system calls with E calls and O calls and some special enclave instructions. So like rewriting your program to be able to work in enclave if it's big enough, it's, it's time consuming, it's difficult, it may not, yeah. It's, it's generally difficult. So what can be a solution? There is like specific amount of system calls. So we can have a library that is automatically translating these calls that the application is making into these calls that are enclave calls, so e calls and o calls. So you're just wrapping your application in this library and everything is done automatically. You don't have to do anything else, you just use this library, wrap your code, and it, then it can be executed in the enclave. So that's even more cool, right? Especially that library like that already existed. Some of them, like one of the coolest with this very narrow pla platform adaptation layer, so more secure one was called Graphene. But the problem was that it was like this scientific project that was like side project developed at the university in spare time. So it was not production ready. There were many bugs, many problems, especially connected to the race condition. So company that is working with us, Invisible Things Lab, took this Graphene library and starting to bug fixing it, changing and making it more production ready, fixing on this case condition part, bugs, memory leaks and other problems. That's how we get Graphene NG. That is the fork of the Graphene library, almost production ready. Additionally, Invisible Things Lab team added Docker container. So right now, if you want to run a code in the enclave, you just have to inherit from their Docker, specify some resource files, and that's all. It's ready to be run inside. No other steps required. And that's really important, and it's really important not only for Golem, but also for other crypto projects that may use this functionality. Uh, not crypto projects, generally for projects that may want to use this data protection from the host machine and the verification of the computation for whatever purpose it's needed. You can take arbitrary binary, wrap it in this new Docker container, it's ready. Of course, there is still but, and this but is efficiency penalty, so there is like 128 megabytes of available memory for your application, and if it's used more, then there is this paging me um, changing mechanism that is giving some efficiency penalty around 30%. If your application is not doing something very strange with the memory, it's random jumps all the time, so the question is if 30% is or not. Maybe it's worth it if you get these two answer for these two main questions instead. And the additional difficulty is that right now it supports only a single process application, but we are also working on resolving that. And the last big topic that I'm going to talk about is this new marketplace because that's the central part of Golem. So you want to connect providers, so people that are sharing these computational machines, and requesters, so people who has job that should be executed. And they've got like different goals. The providers want to earn as much as possible, requesters want to pay as little as possible and to get the results as quickly as possible. And the strategy that was implemented in Golem recently was extremely simple. Like, if you're, the other node is fulfilling the basic criteria, reputation criteria, and the price criteria, and potentially performance criteria, and it's first, and the first node that wants to compute the task is chosen. And for task selection, it was also very simple, like you just task randomly. 
and those very simple mechanisms were good enough because they were resilient to many attacks, but uh, yeah, they are not optimizing the goals of these two actors here. So we have a team of mathematicians and scientists. If some of you are students from uh, also university in mathematics and informatics, then you may know Professor Benke, so he's like working on this algorithm right now. Uh, we wrote mathematical model for this market and some new equation for proper strategies for provider to set the price and for requester to choose the optimal set for of providers, how the new reputation should be computed. And I know this equation are just for the making nice picture, the right equation, but I would don't want to talk about them. The blog post about marketplace should be published in the next few weeks as well. So you can get more details how it's going to work. And we have started to implementing it. So your Golem notes um, may expect higher profits and cheaper computation in the nearest future. And just shortly mention other things that we're working on. We have Cly team that is more working on like refactoring of Golem and optimizing it and using and implementing this um, new task API for more generalized computation. And new parts of Golem are being implemented in Rust because Python was good for this first prototype, but if you want to create something more scalable for the future, we need to change the language. So like the main language for Golem right now is Rust. Um, marketplace, this equation was for the provider selection. Task selection is still under development. Also the better reputation system that can be used in the future in other pro blockchain projects. We have a spin-off project that is called Unlimited and it's specialized column that can be run inside data centers or intranets or trusted solutions. So the trust requirements that are needed in Golem for verification um, can be dropped there. And further research about SGX and what can we do more with that and MG? Can we use it to distribute consent? Can we use it to decentralize other parts of other projects. That's also an open question. And by the way, how many of you have tried to install Golem Brass Beta? And how many of you succeeded? <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, that was optimistic. We tried to increase these stats in the end, and that's the, like, the thought that I want to end my talk about. And do we have any Questions maybe from the audience? My name is Rafa. I have actually two questions. One, the first is about uh, what is the minimal hardware uh, requirements for the member to join the Golem project as a uh, computing power uh, provider? And the second one is about uh, the price unit uh, which you use uh, uh, and uh, actually the, the lever of the price which is currently can be can be uh, can, can act as a profit for me as me for as a provider okay so the minimum requirements it's gonna change in the future right now it's around two gigabytes of ram to be able to handle uh heavier computation in docker images uh, also it depends if you're using windows or linux like the dockers on windows for example are quite they're using virtual machines, so they're heavier, so they require more RAM and around one gigabyte of hard drive. But like nodes like that can compute something in column network, but may not fulfill requirements for uh, for better task. Like if someone is trying to render something that is more professional, not like just playing with stuff, but like a heavier scene that it will require around two gigabytes of RAM. Uh, eight cores, so it's like reasonable configuration. What about the CPU power? Because I thought it's the most important part. Yeah, like you can deal with i5 and four cores, but 
as I said, the better machine you have, the faster you compute task, and the better is your performance score, which will assign you better tasks. Okay, and uh, for example, if I have an i5 with five cores, uh, how is it can be profitable for me when I use a when I use a Golem as a, as a computing uh, power provider? Cannot give you any specific numbers right now. Like this price is circulating, and we're having some stats, but also we have only the stats that are officially sent to our monitor, and not all nodes send these stats. If you would like to make some more incentives to the providers, you should know the price. Okay. Yeah, but <laughs> it's going to like change dynamically, so we can just work on, on stats right now. Sorry for not having tried. Because I'm not currently, I know if if it's profitable for me or not. You know, the power the power costs. You know, yeah. the amortization and stuff like that. Yeah, I know, but like, as I said, no. no. And a uh, very important client will set a higher price, so more providers will join the network. Uh, can you say something more about uh, paying without the gas price? Um, yeah, the, there was this proposal to Ethereum, and I don't know what's the effect of the workshop in Berlin. Uh, I'm not sure if it was yesterday or it's happening right now. Okay, so it's gonna be soon, so we don't have any more details about this proposal. It's one of the proposals with some like additional proxy that will accept the payments in the token later and just get a slightly more tokens for the miner. Uh, I know that maybe I'm looking too far in the future, but I have a question about the quantum computing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know that's quite far future, but are you like looking at your project that after the moment that when we have the quantum computing for now it's working and you're making money and everything is like going on? Or do you have any plan, let's say that, I don't know, IBM and Intel tomorrow will announce that, okay, we got it and you completely don't know what to do? I was listening to the podcast recently with a cryptographer talking about what we should do, how should we prepare ourselves for the quantum computing, and his opinion was, you shouldn't prepare right now. Let cryptographer work and first uh, define proper cryptography, and also with this quantum computing, are you assuming that like normal person is going to have a quantum computer at home, or is it going just to be supercomputers that is owned by IBM and Google and big companies? Yeah, sure, I know that there is like many questions to answer. Like the main thing, I mean that you're saying that you're creating the supercomputer, compu which is decentralized, and we do not need to have 5,000 GPUs combined all together. Like, I'm only asking, do you have like? any plan like whatsoever or like for now you're saying that there is no quantum computing we do not give the we do not give the f and it's fine for now you can connect quantum computers inside golem network and use quantum computers as golem nodes for example that's like one poten like one potential future so they just gonna compute everything there and just send the resonance back it's one right. option Thanks. or maybe nobody is going to have computer anymore it, it, someone creates real quantum computer, as per definition, we have much serious problems than Golem supporting it, because basically most of the encryption in the world doesn't work, and you cannot connect to the bank. And, uh, so that, but I wanna, uh, there is a, a company called D-Wave, though, and they have something similar to quantum computer, and they already have 4,096 qubits, and they're selling for a couple, uh, tens of thousands of dollars you can buy a computer and there's a plenty of deployments in the world and universities and in army uh, and in uh, uh, army research facilities but it's not the quantum computer per se it's not something that can break all the cycle a lot of cycles so if someone says something about quantum computer 
most likely it doesn't mean anything. So, but I had a question. So, um, about economy. If I if I'm uh, if I want to buy some computation, well, two questions. One about model of computation, and one about economy. So, econ uh, if I'm going to buy some uh, well, computational power, will it be cheaper with Golem than if I go to say Amazon, that can utilize the uh, uh, well, this massive scale, cheap, cheap electricity? DevOps, optimized, optimized computers, and you know, basically like 10 or more years of optimization of uh, price of computing. Optimization, right, but also being actually monopolist, or of course, uh, competing with Google Cloud. Oligopolist. Oligopolist, yep. Uh, yeah, this, like buying. Computing power from Amazon is still expensive, so uh, like many users will be happy just getting enough money for paying for electricity and hardware usage, not necessarily getting a lot of additional income. So there is like this additional field where we can compete with the price. It will also depend on these use cases. If you don't require extremely powerful machines or on use case. Like Julian probably can tell more about our price approach. Uh, well, the second question I had is about because you talk a lot about uh, model of computation on CPU, but the most computations in the world today are done on GPUs that include artificial intelligence and so on. Could you elaborate a little bit on that topic? So you missed this first slide, probably. Uh, I, I did. Yeah, the, there was this small announcement that we have this GPU integration implemented and we're going to add it soon, like very, very soon, so this GPU computation can be there. But there, I don't fully agree that like all computation take place in GPU. For example, in this rendering market still, there is a huge, huge amount of uh, rendering that takes place on CPU because you can uh, on GPU, have some memory requirements, so you cannot compute there everything. Writing code for GPU is difficult. And you've got this non-determinism that I mentioned, that it's more visible on GPU. So there is still a lot of use cases that are CPU only. But also, we are adding GPU integration soon. I understand. Thank you very much. And I think we ran out of questions. So huge applause. Hi everyone. Uh, I'll get. I'll just get right into it. My name is Kasima. I uh, am the director of engineering for Plasma at Omazego, and today I'll be talking about the pla the path to more viable plasma. So, how many people in here are familiar with more viable plasma? Not the people who work at Omazego. Uh, <laughs> um, great. This is great. Uh, how many people are familiar with plasma? Okay, doing better. And uh, how many people are familiar with Omazego? OK. Uh, I think by the end of this talk, I hope all of you will be familiar with all three of those things in reverse order of how I just talked about them. Um, so first of all, I'd like to just thank IMAP and Julian for having us and organizing this meetup. Uh, really appreciate it. And it's really great to be here. It's, it's my first time in Warsaw and, and in Poland. And oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and it's such, a, it's such a beautiful city. So let's start with uh, what is Omazego? So Omazego, uh, at Omazego, we're trying to build a public peer-to-peer -peer permissionless payment network. It's a lot of P's there. Um, <laughs> and we're doing that as a decentralized exchange, because when we think about um, being a global payment network, a universal payment network, we think about exchange and value. Because uh, merchants will accept a lot of different currencies, and users will, accept, will have a lot of different currencies, and exchange is how we will ex like, transmit those, those, that value. And so um, we're focused on mobile wallets starting in Southeast Asia um, because of, uh, a little bit because of the story of where Omazego came from. So Omazego grew out of a company called Omaze, uh, which Elaine mentioned, which is a, a traditional payment card gateway company. Um, and so, so what we've learned at Omaze is that payment card penetration in Southeast Asia and emerging economies is, is really low, and it's not growing very quickly. Really, um, in these emerging economies, mobile wallets are the future. Um, you can see this happening in Africa, and it's definitely happening in Southeast Asia now. 
Um, and what we really like about mobile wallets is that it, they really lower the barrier to entry for people to participate in these financial networks, um, which promotes financial inclusion and is one of our core missions here at Omizego. And so uh, I won't get too far deep, too much deeper into that because uh, we're, we're, we'll cover the technology part. But um, the way we're building this payment network is we're building a proof of stake blockchain, which is scaled with Plasma. And also, I won't get into the proof of stake part. That's a whole other talk. Uh, but we'll focus on today on Plasma. So uh, what is Plasma? So uh, Plasma is a way to build scalable blockchain applications. And so let's take a step back and, and see why we're here and how we got here. Uh, I think everyone in this room uh, probably can, can generally agree that, that we like blockchains and blockchains are cool for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, permissionless, public, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, all, the, all the things we like about a decentralized service. Uh, but also, I think we all know that blockchains are slow. Uh, when we compare, especially from a payments network perspective, when we compare against something like Visa, um, we look at transactions per second. The numbers I was able to find range from 1,700 transactions per second to 24,000 transactions per second. It's a pretty big range, but when we compare it to uh, something like Bitcoin, which is seven transactions per second, uh, or even Ethereum, which is 20 transactions per second, we are what, like three orders of magnitude away from even the low part of that range. So um, we, we need Plasma. So, so uh, what is Plasma? It's a layer two scaling solution. And uh, do, are people familiar about what that means? Layer two scaling solution? Okay, so um, when, we look at, when, we, when we talk about a layer one scaling solution, we're scaling these main chains, um, like Ethereum or uh, like, let's say, let's say Bitcoin Cash, uh, through things like sharding and uh, block size increases. We're, we're scaling what's happening on the primary chain um, uh, that, that people generally use. A layer two scaling happens in what we call maybe a channel or a side chain that can be confirmed or validated by the main chain. So things like state channels or a lightning network, or the lightning network, or in our case, Plasma. So uh, Plasma was proposed by Joseph Poon and Vitalik Buterin uh, last year in August. In the white paper, it generally describes Plasma as a design pattern, um, or, or even, I guess it's not quite a, a, a data structure, but it's, yeah, it's more of a design pattern, and, and um, it has really grand ideas about how we think we can structure and scale blockchains. Um, but uh, it, it, doesn't, it, there, it isn't really a specification, and so it's under really heavy research by multiple teams around the world, uh, including us. So I'll get into, let's, let's look into how Plasma generally works. This is kind of the basic, most basic form of Plasma. Um, so what we have is a Plasma chain, which is a blockchain that sits next to or, or is associated with a root chain that can run a, a, a contract um, on the main chain. And in our case, uh, that root chain contract runs on Ethereum. So, how, how do we start using or, or transacting the Plasma chain? We start with a, a deposit of some kind of value that comes through our root chain contract. Um, and once we deposit it in there, we, we are, it's available for use on the Plasma chain. So uh, when, when we have our value in the Plasma chain, we can transact all we want, uh, sort of, sort of un, unrelated to the root chain. We can make as many transactions as we want in the Plasma chain. So how do, we, uh, how do we associate that back to the plasma chain? Or to the root chain, I'm sorry. So for every block that's created on a plasma chain, a hash of that state is committed to the root chain contract. And so uh, the hash of that state that we're using at the moment is called uh, Merkle root. And is everyone familiar with, with Merkle trees? Merkle trees, Merkle roots? OK, so, so I'll, I'll go throw through it, but we, um, the Merkle root allows us to compact a lot of state, ver verifiable, validatable state, back to the root chain contract. So we can, we can verify the activity that happens in the plasma chain later. Um, and so why would we want to verify that later? Well, at some point, when we're done transacting in this world of plasma, uh, we might want to exit back out to the root chain. So say you deposit some OMG to uh, trade on, on the OMG network, uh, which is a plasma chain or in a plasma construction, at some point we might want to take whatever value we get back out, back to the main chain and do something else with it. So, so uh, we allow exits uh, when, you want to get, when you want to get your value back or your state. Um, we also 
this is really important part of Plasma, that we allow safe exits when things go wrong in the Plasma chain. And this is a really important part of the Plasma construction. So uh, here's, here's the general, general uh, base case of, of, of a Plasma construction. And um, the way this scales the transactions on the main chain is that, uh, first of all, in the Plasma chain, we don't, share any, we don't share any transaction throughput with any other application. So, so everything that happens in the Plasma chain is uh, associated with our application. So we're not sharing this with, say, CryptoKitties or some other dApp. Um, so that's the first way. And the second way is for every block that happens in the, in the Plasma chain, depending on how, how big that block is, uh, we only need one transaction happening on the root chain. So there's some multiple there. So say we're allowed to have, say we're supporting 1,000 transactions per block on the Plasma chain. We only need one block on the root chain to support that. So that's the beginning of it. But now you're probably wondering, aren't we limited by the transaction throughput on the Plasma chain? Like at some point, we'll just hit that. What do we do there? Well, the white paper basically says this. Do people know this meme? OK. <laughs> so in the white paper, um, what it basically says is that what we can have is a tree of plasma chains. So plasma chains on plasma chains on plasma chains. It's really, it's plasma chains potentially all the way down. Um, we're not quite here yet, but this is something that uh, we, we think that might, we think might be possible. And it's described in the white paper. So if we're able to achieve something like this, we achieve concurrency and horizontal scaling. So why? why? Why do this? Especially if you already have this plasma chain running. Say, say we have the base case of, of the plasma chain. We have it running. Why do we need this whole let's submit stuff back to the root chain? Well, general, so we're generally confident that Ethereum um, itself is secure. And so by using this plasma construction, what we end up doing is we extend the security of Ethereum over our plasma chains. And so if, there, if there's anything that goes wrong in the plasma chain, we can always refer it back up to our Supreme Court, which is Ethereum, and safely exit. And the really key piece, like I was mentioning about exits before, is that plasma chains are as safe as the root chain. They don't need to be as safe as the plasma chain consensus mechanism. So if there's a failure there, you can always get back out. So I think it's also important to mention um, what plasma is not. So when we talk about Plasma in general, when we talk about the white paper, um, we're not talking about any particular specification. So that is part of what is under heavy research at the moment. Plasma is also not a smart contract platform, at least not yet. Um, there are very, some, some very specific things, very specific reasons why that's not possible at the moment. And it mostly has to do with constraints of what it means to have exitable state, exitable, ownable state. Um, but this is something that, that our research team uh, is really interested in looking into soon for the future. Uh, so keep an eye on that. And, and, and the final thing is that Plasma is not in production anywhere yet, no matter what you call your chain. <laughs> um, it's, and, and I think our project is the closest to being in production. Uh, and, and we hope to have more news about that coming pretty soon. So how do we get there? How do we get to production? Uh, let's go through, the, so, so then we had to talk about the Plasma specifications. So how do we build this thing? So, and, and the space is moving pretty fast, so I'm trying to give you an overview of what kind of specifications are available or have come out around Plasma now. But first, let, let, let me show you how I sort of think about um, these specifications. There are basically two flavors of Plasma right now. Uh, we have a fungible version and a non-fungible version. And so um, for the fungible version, and uh, what happens there is when you make a deposit, the, the, the root chain contract basically holds a single pile of value. So you, so you deposit in there, it's a single pile of value that's shared by everyone who's, who's transacting in the plasma chain. And in our case, um, the value there is allocated by UTXOs. So people are familiar with UTXOs. Should we go into that for a second? UTXOs, okay, I'll keep moving. Um, so, so yeah, a, a, a shared pool of money allocated to everyone by UTXOs. In the non-fungible version, what happens is when you make a deposit, that value of that deposit ends up being represented in the plasma chain by a token. And that token ends up being, tr being transacted on, on the plasma chain as a non-fungible token. 
so it doesn't get split up. Um, it's that whole thing. And uh, because of that, the non-fungible version offers some really interesting characteristics um, that are some, some design challenges for the fung fungible version. Um, but for our use case, for having, for having a DEX, um, we really need the fungible version. So I won't go too deeply into the non-fungible version, but here are the specifications that have come out. There's, in, in terms of fungible, there's more minimal viable plasma, more viable plasma. Uh, minimal viable plasma was specified by Vitalik. I think that was the first specification of plasma. And more viable plasma was specified by our research team, namely Kelvin Fichter, who's sitting there, um, arguably the world's leading expert on plasma. Um, I feel comfortable saying that. Uh, <laughs> so the non-fungible version, we have plasma cache, um, plasma XT, which is, which is an extension of plasma cache, and we have plasma debit, which is like a slightly more fungible version of plasma cache. Um, but I'll leave that up to you guys to go into because uh, I want to dig in over there to let you know what we're doing. So let's start with uh, minimal viable plasma. Uh, so here, here are the characteristics of minimal viable plasma. Like I said, it's fungible. Um, it's a single plasma chain, so it's minimal. It's a, the base case. Um, transacting UTXOs. And uh, one of the things that, that keeps, so the key piece that keeps the exit safe in minimal viable plasma is this exit priority. So, um, so there are certain things, so the exit priority is what guarantees safety. And there are specific things that you need to do to be a good plasma citizen um, or to, to use that value well. So, so I think all forms of money have something like this, right? Like um, if you're working with cash and you leave your cash out on the street, we probably can't help you not lose that cash. So there are things like that about being a good plasma citizen as well. And so one of the things you need to do is to watch the chain and uh, if things start going wrong, um, if the operator starts being malicious, the operator of the plasma chain, or there, there's other, some, some other breakdown, you need to initiate an exit. And the exit priority guarantees that your exit comes before all the activity that's gone, that's gone wrong. So, so that is um, a really important part of minimal viable plasma and its safety. So the next thing that is part of minimal viable plasma that's interesting is these confirmation signatures. So in minimal viable plasma, uh, when you send a transaction, they're assumed invalid until they're confirmed. So it's a pessimistic operation. So we basically wait until the transaction is included. The sender waits until the transaction is included in the chain properly. And then they send a confirmation to the receiver. And then that confirmation is used to exit. So, so in, in the specific case of, um, say, block withholding, um, we ensure safety while a transaction is in flight. So basically, what, if, if you send a transaction, the operator could be doing something with it, like p including a block, submitting it back to the root chain, but you don't know. So uh, the operator might be able to do something funny before your transaction happens, so, and, and they might be able to exit before you do. So the way we prevent that is we rely on the sender to make sure that the chain is operating correctly, and then we, we rely on that sender to send a confirmation, and that confirmation is important for the next transaction or to exit. So, so that's, that's an important piece for confirmation signatures. The problem is that uh, it's kind of a bad, it's bad UX, right? We, 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 um, we need, it's basically, a, to send a transaction, it's, it's a two-step process. And also, we believe that for the most part, for the vast majority of transactions, things will be okay. So um, that led us to our research team to develop more viable plasma, which is um, a very, a, a small, but, but I think very important and, and uh, significant modification on minimal viable plasma. So again, so here are the things that are the same. It's fungible. Single plasma chain uses UTXOs. There's a small modification to the exit priority, um, which, which achieves the same goal. Um, but the big one is that there are no confirmation signatures. So it turns transactions into an optimistic operation. So transactions are assumed valid when sent, um, uh, which we, we assume is going to be the vast majority of transactions. But what we need is a mechanism to safely exit in that, sing in that special case when you have transactions in flight and something goes wrong. So what we developed was an exit game to cover, to, to allow people to exit an in-flight transaction, a transaction that you're not sure has been included in the plasma chain yet. So 
the exit game I'll cover very quickly. Um, so in the exit game, anyone can exit an in-flight transaction, can start an exit. Um, it's a two-period game. Let's see where my notes are. So it starts with a challenge period where um, someone can reveal a challenge to challenge the exit, and then there's a response period that someone can challenge or respond to the challenge, or the original user can respond to the challenge and confirm the exit. And if that's true, um, the exit happens. Or if the challenge doesn't get responded to, the exit doesn't happen. Uh, we think that that shouldn't happen too often, but obviously we need it there for safety. So that is, that is generally, there, there's a lot more, um, a lot more detail to more viable plasma, and I invite you to, uh, well, I'll talk to you in about a minute, but I invite you to learn more um, in our resources in our GitHub repo. But uh, so what is next? What's next for Plasma? Well, um, one of these key design challenges that I talked about that exists in the fungible version of a Plasma specification and not in a non-fungible version is this idea of mass exits. So if something goes terribly wrong, we want to be able to exit, everyone to exit out of the Plasma chain very quickly. Um, but there might be cases of root chain congestion, and that might be, people might, might not make it out in time. So there's some really active research into um, making that efficient and really possible. Uh, the next thing is also more scale. We're still looking at a single, we're still built off a single plasma chain. Um, and it's still more viable plasma, but it's probably not, probably not the most viable plasma. So, uh, so over the next months, years, um, we'll be looking at modifying plasma for more scale. And uh, we'll probably call it something like even more viable plasma. So. Uh, and then, of course, we need to ship stuff. Um, and so that's, that's our focus as well. So if you want to learn more, um, you can come to our, our site, is omizego.network. On Twitter, we are omize underscore go. And then I would invite you to come to our, our uh, GitHub organization where you have these three repos that are probably relevant to your interests if you're interested in learning more about Plasma. And um, I'll start with the Elixir OMG repo, which we just uh, made public a couple weeks ago, thanks to some heroic efforts by our engineering team and especially our Warsaw-based engineering team. Uh, and there is a bunch of documentation in there about um, the current milestone of our design and also a, a document that, that uh, a paper describing more viable plasma in, in, in complete detail. Um, there's also our plasma contracts, which is our production root chain contracts for plasma. And then we have our research repo, which is a bunch of documentation and some planning, and you can see um, where we're going and what we've done in terms of research. Uh, so thank you. Um, my name is Kasima, and you can probably find me on most platforms at Kasima, um, mainly Twitter, GitHub, and of course, uh, we're hiring. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, because you mentioned um, your tokens, right, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to, to see. Do you have a public repo of uh, GitHub, GitLab, right, uh, to let us inspect a code? Because um, I'm watching like a, a private investor, let's say, right? Uh, and before investing in any, any project, I'd like to inspect a code, uh, what's, in, uh, what's included into the code, what's not, after inspecting uh, yes, indeed, I'm, uh, I, I'm in. Is it? Absolutely. So, so one of our core values also is we're building a public good. And so part of that public good is uh, making it public. So everything that we will deploy, everything we're working on is happening in the open. So you can definitely come to those repos, inspect where we are. Um, we're doing all our development, the development in the open. And um, we're trying to contribute as much as we can back to the community. Contracts as well, the whole thing. One question, because I don't get one thing. Because you have said that uh, at some time the plasma will put a hash of the Merkel, Merkel roots of all transactions mm -hmm. on the main chain of mm -hmm. Ethereum. Uh, so who will be responsible for putting those transactions, for propagating those transactions? And what will be the, uh, let's say, the uh, process of uh, verification of such transaction? OK. So uh, Model. yeah, so, so the. So we're phasing our, our, our uh, network release in, into a few phases. And, and um, for the first phase, we're going to be the Plasma chain operator. At, it's going to be a proof of authority chain, and we are the operator. 
So as, as the operator, it is, a, is our responsibility. Said. What's that? It's said. Oh, no, it's coming. It's, you know, it's engineering. It has to iterate. We're, we're iterating on this process. So, so for our MERS milestone is going to be proof of authority, and we are the ones who are submitting that back to the chain. In the second stage, the whole part that I didn't talk about is as a proof of stake network, it'll be up to the operators and built into the protocol there that you need to submit, um, as you propose a block, you, you as the operator of that validator will have to submit that block back to the, back to the root chain contract. I think it's also important to mention that even if Plasma would be in the cloud, that's the whole point because it inherits the security of the main chain. So if operator does anything against the chain, the sub-chain, there is a way to exit. That's the whole point. So it's perfectly fine to have proof of authority early on in the game and even later in the game as well. Right? So that's the whole idea of the cloud. You are, if you can expect our contracts, and if our plasma sophistication is built correctly, you are safe from our malfeasance. Uh, I, uh, I have another question. You mentioned this executable state. So mm -hmm. why, if we imagine that uh, plasma chain is like Ethereum-like, Ethereum-like uh, chain that has a blocks and blocks has a root of the state tree and they have a root of uh, transactions and so on and so forth, then why, uh, why is that not executable state? So, so when we talk about executable state in, in terms of, of smart contract execution, um, we need, so, so there's a lot of things that can happen in the course of a contract execution, right? There's all, there's all these side effects that happen. The key is to be able to capture, in, this, in the event of something going wrong in the plasma chain, the key is to be able to capture all, those, all that state change and bring it out back to the root chain, right? Um, so how is uh, uh, un, uh, un, uh, UXTO, UTXO uh -huh. better than a, than a uh, root hash of a state of the account? Partly is because um, the, UTXO, the, the UTXO is owned, right? So, so um, individuals can come in with state and exit with that state, right? They own that state. Um, if you're ex executing a smart contract, who owns, the, who owns the state change and on top of what? So, so how, do you, how, do you separate, how do you separate the, the stacking of state change and also um, how do you separate that ownership of the result? So, so there are some constraints around that and we're doing some research around it very, very soon and hopefully um, we, we will publish. Well, we, we publish everything that we research but hopefully we can talk about it soon. Great answer, thank you. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Thank you very much. Okay, so hello and welcome to Horde. It's a place where blockchain meets game dev. Um, so um, this, in, this uh, presentation will be a slightly different from the others because I want to introduce you to this new project you probably don't know of and there will be so less technical details as you have seen in uh, Plasma presentation or Golem uh, but more like philosophy what we are trying to achieve. Um, so first, uh, some introductions. My name is Cyril Matuszewski. I am the lead programmer of the development team in Golem. And uh, as it is uh, connected with the blockchain, so also we, the, the company has been created with, in the spirit of blockchain. So we try to be as decentralized as possible. So we come from four different continents. Yay. And <laughs> Um, okay, so our team, uh, a part of that is also multi-specialized because as you can see, we have a blockchain and the game dev. So we have experienced um, professionals from the game dev uh, the, uh, industry. We have people that spent 10 plus years making AAA games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, uh, Dark Souls, Resident Evil, and things like that you probably heard. Uh, also, we have uh, very talented people from the blockchain community. And this uh, constitutes some part of people that worked formerly for Omise or Golem. So uh, that's why we are in the same hub. Uh, we also have a very uh, splendid backend developer so we can test our environment and compare it to some other solutions that are based on cloud, for example, Google Cloud or uh, Amazon. Uh, we have a game designer too, so we can speak with other um, game developers and at least uh, see what are the problems that at whatever tasks we would need to achieve. Uh, now, uh, before we go further, um, I would like to ask you a few questions so I get my audience better. Uh, okay, so who of you is from the blockchain community? Hands up. 
Okay, most. And are there any game developers here? Awesome, and they are not from Horde even. Great. And <laughs> okay, the, the next question will be much simpler. Who have ever played a game, a video game? Yay, and who has ever paid some amount of money inside the game to buy some additional content, maybe some premium? Cool, that's, that's okay, that means that game developers are earning money. Okay, uh, <laughs> so um, it seems, so it, it will be no surprise for you that uh, it seems that as of 2017, the game industry has, uh, has brought a biggest revenue from the all entertainment industry. So it was, uh, it exceeded 100 billion dollars. That's uh, quite a lot of this. And as you can see, uh, it's much more than any of the others. Uh, so you can see that, for example, books was one third and uh, home video, uh, uh, yeah, it's a little bit cut. Okay, so I will tell you what's inside. So basically the home video is like one fifth of that. Now the funny thing is that around 80% of this video game revenue comes solely from the downloadable content on or in-game purchases. So it's not based on uh, the fact that you bought a game, but you bought something inside the game. Uh, okay, what's the problem with that? The, the most important problem is that all of you who have bought any item, you don't really own this item. This is stored somewhere on the decentralized database and you don't have any rights to to do anything with that. Well, you can use it in that game, but you cannot sell it, you cannot uh, lend it to someone, or you can't even give it to um, your family members or friends. Now, that's a pity, because basically you own this, uh, those items, but you don't. And uh, which the players are really um, understanding this fact, because, I don't know, there was no uh, technology so far, so they could really own this, uh, those items. Um, the fact is that they get accustomed to that and they play games and give people money. I mean, us game developers, they give money, that's cool. Uh, but they don't have, have, have any rights about this, which, which seems a little bit surprising given the number of movies and books that recently were published uh, that really show, the, the science fiction books really, that really show our future when people go into virtual worlds and they own the properties, the virtual properties uh, this year there was uh, quite a nice movie made by Spielberg. It was Player One. It was based on a novel, uh, Ready Player One, where people come into virtual worlds and they have their cars and their avatars, skins and, their, uh, and different stuff, and they really own that. Uh, so that's why Horde came up to um, solve these issues and possibly many more. And uh, the Horde is based on three pillars. The first pillar, the most important one, is the true ownership. Um, so let's look a little bit more about the current pro problems with true ownership. As we know, as I already told you, we, that there is a lack of true ownership. We understand that. The second thing is the revenue sharing. What does it mean? Basically, for the game developers, there is only one possible stream of gaining revenue. It is the direct sell of the goods, of the virtual goods. No other exists for now. And the third one, the fact that the digital assets are kept in a centralized databases doesn't, necess doesn't only mean that uh, there's a problem with true ownership, but basically this is uh, badly designed because it is, um, this creates an opportunity for malicious behavior, for cracking those databases, gaining assets, and so where recently many black markets popped out uh, where the, the, the scammed uh, items are being sold. And as you can see from other, other numbers. Um, so basically for each item that is legitimately sold, seven or uh, six, seven are being scammed from players, uh, which doesn't sound good both for the players because they invest time in playing games and in gaining that loot and then they lose it and it doesn't sound good for the game developers that basically uh, lose revenue. Uh, Steam blog is constantly talking about this stuff. So as you can see, 77,000 uh, accounts have been hijacked and pillaged each month. That is really a lot, especially that there are professional players that earn for a living by playing games or different tournaments. Uh, the Counter-Strike tournaments, for example, this is uh, a really huge amount of money. Um, all right, so uh, as we know, we are talking about blockchain. So the simplest idea how to solve this problem 
let's use the blockchain, right? Let's tokenize those items and put them on the blockchain so they're public, pub publicly, uh, every, everyone can see this. This is a global network, this is a trustless network, and to, this is, for now, the most secure technology uh, we have. Um, right, so uh, let's, there are two perspectives uh, of this ownership. Let's say there will be a player perspective and a game developer perspective. Uh, they are completely different, uh, I have to say. Now, what other value it, uh, this, this blockchain, this true ownership opportunity brings to gamers? First of all, they can finally transfer, trade, rent those items. Not completely freely, because there must be some li license, you know, there are digital rights, and the game developers uh, might have some restrictions based on that, but basically the possibility is finally there. Uh, another thing is the limited and digital and collectibles. You can think CryptoKitties, you can think this is the item that was only available during the Kickstarter, and I have the ownership of that, I own it, I have a receipt somewhere there lying on the blockchain. Uh, now, since you know that no, uh, no information is being lost in the blockchain, so we can have a complete history of items of uh, being sold, being transferred, but also if we can think that those items have some additional uh, properties, for example, strength or some statistics, we can have... Uh, we can have some additional information. For example, I can say, hey, I took this monumental raid in League of Legends and it was me because there was my avatar and I can prove it. Or, for example, I was the championship winner three times in a row uh, in uh, NASCAR racing. Um, another uh, value that is uh, possible is, for example, the upgradable items. What does it mean? Well, basically, if I have a sword plus one, but it's kind of lame item, and then I upgrade it because I invested some money and some time with playing this sword, and now it's plus five, it has bigger value. I can sold it for more. T uh, for more. Um, the one stuff that is missing from this slide is digital art. Um, some, for example, there is a nice virtual reality game. I don't know, I don't remember the name now, but you put your HTC helmet on your head, and with your hands, you are sculpting with light, with particles, with snowflakes, with flame, and you can do a really nice and beautiful sculptures. And this is art. This is something that you cannot do physically and show it to other people unless they also go into the virtual world. Now, if I have created this, so I'm an artist and I want to sell it, either sell it or I can, I don't know, rent it to a museum and get some income from that, so why not doing this? And if I have this tokenized on the blockchain, this is again possible. So this was the player perspective, but why the game developers should be happy about that? Well, basically they get the stream revenue, the mainstream revenue is from the direct sell. So they don't care if the players will trade those items or rather they don't, would li wouldn't like to allow it unless we give them some new opportunities. Okay, so the secondary markets, what's that? Well, assume that I am a game developer and I'm selling uh, one of the items to Jane. Now, Jane wants to sell it to Bob, but if this sell has some transaction fee that goes back to me, then, well, I'm happy with that. I can even create a free-to-play game with free items and I can distribute them among the players. And if the game balance, I mean, the game logic is about exchanging those items, trading them, then I will get the subsequent, I mean, I will get money, a revenue from subsequent sales of those items. Um, now, we're always talking about money and about trading, but there is one very important feature for the game developers uh, they, but it's like a golden egg, let's call it. It means that the game developers would like to know what players want. This is cool because they will create then a game that players will buy. Now the problem with that is there is not only game developers doesn't know what players want, but players also doesn't know what they need, what, what, what they want, right? And uh, so this, now there is some methods of gaining the information, what the player does, what games he plays, what item he's using, what levels he likes, I don't know what colors. This is called, there is in game developers jargon, it's called telemetry. For the telemetric systems of uh, keeping a lot of statistics per player, per his uh, actions, per items perhaps, and this gives uh, us, game developers, some new insight into how this, uh, the game should be created. 
Now, if this uh, is all stored on the blockchain, and this is a global network where everyone can use it, so basically it means that I can check what the player was doing in other games, what games he played, what kind of style he likes, what kind of theme he likes. And based on that, I can, in my game, I can give him a content that is really customized for him. It's something like Google Ads, right? So basically when I was looking for one an hour, what, time? Okay, I will go quicker, sure. So, so let's go. To, okay, the telemetry is very important and it means that basically uh, the game developers uh, gain some information and then they customize the game. Okay, the second pillar is the crowdfunding. Uh, now, in the long, in the old time, uh, long, long, long time ago, it was looked like it looked like that that the um, game developer had a bright idea. He went to a publisher. He said, "I need money to create this game." The publisher gave him five million bucks, and the game developer was away making the game. Now there are dark times, and basically, the game the publishers doesn't say that. They said, "Okay, bring me the complete game, and then maybe I will give you some money." So the Kickstarter was created, so the crowdfunding idea, so people will gather up some cash and give it to game developers so he can create a nice game. Uh, now this is a nice idea, the problem is with the crowdfunding rewards. They are not really so cool. This is like you get a t-shirt, you get, I don't know, a digital copy of course, maybe you will get your name will be somewhere in the credits. Um, but what if the backers could actually participate in the economy? What does it mean? So let's assume that when a game needs to be created, it is creating its own game currency, and people are paying money for buying this game currency. Now this game currency is the in-game currency. It means that you can later on buy something in the game. Uh, additional assets, I don't know, ac um, access to services, and things like that. Um, uh, now it, this is tokenized and this is really a currency, it really looks like an ICO model. What it means that if the games become a hit, it means that this currency rises in value. Now I have invested 20 bucks in a game and now I have, I don't know, 100 bucks because this tokens got, uh, have a better value. Um, so basically this, all, this is also the one more important thing that people that are, um, but are uh, but are using the ICO model and they are uh, okay it's back uh, and they are investing its money they are more engaged in such a game so they would like to to see this game better and they if the developer is nourishing this uh, um, this economy it might get better for example some additional apps some additional things even uh, events even before the game uh, is being on uh, will be released. Uh, and the third pillar, the virtual jobs. I already mentioned that there are some things that people can do and earn money, basically by playing. Uh, now, if we assume that in the monetizing uh, features, the virtual items are really equal to the physical items, um, it means uh, it means that this, uh, just a minute, I have something nice word here. Um, I mean, this means that you can, for example, Go, imagine a, a simple scenario. Uh, uh, at one evening, you're going on a ride in your game and you get some incredible loot. Now you can go with this loot to a plasma chain and basically liquidate it for some McDonald's tokens. And then in the morning, you can go and buy yourself a McDonald's burger, right, for those tokens. So basically, now you have earned for your breakfast simply by playing. Now you can earn a dinner and a supper and maybe you can earn for your bill, uh, bills and maybe you can earn your living by simply playing a game. Um, uh, so the Horde Exchange is a place where we would like to, uh, for the players to see what items they have, what games they have and uh, to see the trade offers, to trade one items for other items or for basically the Horde tokens. And this is, uh, this all of course you can then exit to some other exchanges like for example the Plasma, uh, Omise Plasma Exchange, why not? And liquidate it for some other stuff. So as we can see, the game developers can be the future employers because some new additional jobs can be created, not only pay for play, uh, but for example, asset creators. Uh, if you have uh, a kit, you can create um, some additional content for the game. Uh, if the game developer certifies that and agrees, 
so uh, in that moment you can sell it, you can gain a revenue, and then ag again the secondary market comes into place. So some revenue goes to the publisher, some revenue goes to developer, and some, give a, some revenue goes to you because you are the asset creator. Um, I don't know, coaching, so you can hire someone to help you run the game uh, and go through the game. You can see how he was progressing and now do the same. Uh, blogging and reviewing, basically you can pay the bloggers to show and to um, and to promote your game on their blogs by giving them uh, your tokens, then those tokens can of course be uh, used to play the game or they can be liquidated. Um, game moderation and of course in-game ads and uh, commercials because there's always room for that. Um, what does it mean? It means that in the future where the AI and the machine learning, that is cool by the way, but will make some people basically obsolete and they will lose their jobs, they can still get some money and they earn a living by going into virtual worlds. <laughs> yes, it seems science fiction, but it's, well, I really believe that. Uh, now, another funny thing is, uh, um, is the thing that the economy, the virtual economy inside the game might be more stable than the economy in your country. Well, this is happening, for example, in Venezuela, where the, um, the value of their currency is now worth like nothing. So basically, people are trying to use the USD and buy USD. So in that case, uh, if you are a player and you will gain the, the Horde tokens or other game tokens, uh, so this might be a better currency than your, <laughs> your national currency, and you can go abroad and at least be, have some money. Um, OK, so this was the idea, and this was our, uh, um, how we see this project. So where are we now? This, is the, this will be three slides, and I mean two slides, and, but three uh, very important topics. So first thing is the SDK for game devs. Um, since we are from the game development industry and we know how the SDKs look like and we know how they look for different engines like Unity or Unreal or for different platforms like Xbox One, PS2, 3, 4, and so on, uh, we want to make a one-click solution uh, SDK manager that will install everything, like create a test net in your development or uh, in your development um, office, or basically connect to an existing test net. Uh, and there is also some scripts that will create new games and items. Uh, by the way, the things that are in bold are already implemented. The rest is on our roadmap. Uh, plugins for Unity 3D and Unreal Engine 4, so you automatically gain access to our Horde platform, uh, are already done. And now the most important thing that in the easiest version, you don't have to even know Solidity and you don't even have to know how blockchain work in order to use uh, our SDK. Uh, automatic game server setup. Now, we don't really think that game servers are required, but they would be needed if you would need to do some additional validation. Also, there are games like uh, server client, uh, in server client technology, where of course the server is needed. Now, the powerful tools is basically the expert mode for everything, so for experts. So if you know the blockchain technology and you know how to code in Solidity, you can get the contracts uh, automatically created, change them and upload them to the network. Uh, if you want, uh, if you have your own game server, you can just take some SDK uh, stuff and incorporate into your uh, game server to gain the functionality. And the same happens. So, for example, you have plugin for Unity and uh, you, uh, Unreal Engine 4, but if you have your own homebrew engine, you can just use our SDK. Currently, C++ and C Sharp. But if anyone needs something else, uh, we'll gladly help. Uh, second thing, apps for players. So we have desktop and mobile app uh, being prepared. Um, so basically they are for uh, signing the transactions. We don't want people to really store their private keys on, uh, I don't know, on their console because it's not designed for that. Uh, this will be some two-factor authentication so you can just use your smartphone just to sign the transaction. So if you want to buy something or sell something from the game, you just click a button in the game and then you have to uh, approve it from your transaction using the biometry. Uh, security stuff. Um, uh, the trade application might be integrated with the desktop and mobile one or might be a different one. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so it of course uh, allows you to see the offers uh, on the Horde exchange and the transfer, trade, rent, all of those. Now the third thing uh, that is also quite important is because we are in the IMAP hub and we have direct access to Omisa. <laughs> uh, and there is a problem as you know with scalability of the Ethereum chain. So we want to use the Plasma chain. We currently took the production version of the minimal uh, viable Plasma. 
which is solely for the ERC20 tokens. So we added ERC721 tokens because why not? And it works. Uh, we are now in the phase of testing this solution. We also want to add uh, another transaction type, let's call it, so we can change the state of the tokens. Um, yeah, and basically the idea is where the experts from OMIZ told us that they don't see any drawbacks in that. We don't see any drawbacks with that, with that and we hope that it will work. So join the horde. If you have any questions, just ask me, grab me or any other from our team. Uh, we've got cool community managers that will gladly ask, uh, answer all your questions. I am the technical guy. If you want to go with business, go to our CEO, Swavek Malfunction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Okay, one question. Actually, it's a business question, so maybe one of your colleagues will answer it. But um, you said that it would be nice that if a company could um, um, sell the items to the players and those players would sell them further and further, they would gain any profit. And that's actually exactly how the Steam uh, market is running. Um, and like, what's the difference? Because there are like so many similarities. And I'm really curious, how do you want to convince any company that if they buy anything in their game, it's your property, not the property of, of this company? Okay, so to answer your first question, what's the difference between Steam is because we want to go on the blockchain. So basically the Steam is always complaining on the amount of cash they are losing and the players they are losing because all those uh, trades being done on the Steam exchange are really, uh, well, as you have seen the numbers, so more than 50% of them are basically scams. So people are losing money and we want to go better, right? Um, yeah, sure. but. Steam, I mean Valve, the owner of a few very big games, will probably never allow to share the market of um, the selling market of their items. Like I really can't imagine that the company which is like few of the biggest games in the world is like saying, yeah, sure, we'll just share the profit with you because we have also the market, but why not go on the both? Okay, so the simple answer is, first of all, they are not the only one, so why not create another marketplace? Uh, secondly, the Steam uh, is not the best, and from my experience, I have seen many people, for example, ex for example, Microsoft and Sony, always talking about that they don't want to share anything with anyone, but the time changes, and really, people, the game developers and the players don't want to stick solely to one platform. They want to exchange the data. So sooner or later, this will be possible. Uh, the play, for example, PlayStation in now allows uh, connection with Steam, which was impossible a few years ago. And the same happens, for example, for the Switch. So for Nintendo, they already, when they pushed the new console Switch, they already said that uh, we don't uh, we don't want to have everything. We, you, people can exchange, people go using other servers, so it's possible and it's getting better and better with time. So I assume that Steam at some point will have will have to make a decision and do simply the same. But of course, what will happen? We'll see. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's it. Uh, so that would conclude the first part of our meeting. Uh, that may be surprising, but uh, thank you very much com for coming to ETU Mita Poland. We have some pizza, we have, I think, some more beer left. Uh, please enjoy the networking and ah, there will be some like more announcement. To conclude, we, we wanted to, as, as IMAP and, and all three projects, we wanted to thank you very much, like uh, AdForks and the uh, whole team, uh, Edgar, Jagoda, uh, and uh, Antoni for for uh, organizing that and running Ethereum meet Meetup, uh, and also for to, we we wanted to thank Campus for for hosting the the event here. Thank you very much.